discuss uh, her um, PhD uh, project. But uh, at the end, uh, she told me that the presentation, my presentation should have been in French, and I'm, my command of French is not good at all. So at first I say, oh no, I cannot do that. But uh, after a couple of hours uh, with Valeria, she convinced me to, be, to not to be afraid to be ridiculous and to do this job. So today I will speak in, uh, <laughs> in English and uh, also, this time I couldn't say no. <laughs> um, okay, um, so the idea. Sorry. Uh, is this one? No. It's different from mine. Is this, this one? This one, okay. And that's why I. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, before it worked, so I don't know what mm -hmm. happened. But uh, maybe if here, let's see. Oh. oh, not really. But maybe <laughs> try again. No, 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 no. Okay, I. This is just to anticipate you that there will okay. be very rich. Yes, now it works. <laughs> 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 no, no, okay. Um, so, um, I think my presentation can be a, a little bit complementary with uh, the one we listened to this morning by, by Linda Laura Sabadini. We will talk again about uh, low fertility and in Italy and we try to connect uh, this, um, this situation with uh, gender imbalances in care activities. So, we, we, don't, we will not th um, talk about uh, um, labor market participation only indirectly, but we will try to, to enter the threshold of the household to understand how gender roles are uh, organized within uh, the, the household. This is uh, uh, the idea. So, um, before, I'm a demographer, so just let me give you a brief, <laughs> um, a brief review of what happened uh, in the last decades in Italy. Linda Laura this morning have anticipated uh, many, many things, but maybe we can just uh, uh, fix some ideas on it. And then we will talk about the vicious link between uh, low fertility and gender inequality in a contest like the Italian ones that is still a quite familialistic uh, context. And we will focus on care attitudes and behavior. And then uh, we'll try to just to give some uh, ideas about uh, possible gender policies to support uh, uh, fertility. So let's see, we, we talk, we talked a lot about uh, Italian law fertility, how law, how law is, uh, is it. And, um, and uh, before giving some, uh, some, uh, some uh, figure of it, I think uh, I, I borrowed this uh, graph that has been elaborated by different uh, scholars. And um, that, uh, at least a theoretical uh, way, try to understand the link between uh, the uh, total fertility rate, so the number of children people have, in a uh, woman have in, uh, in uh, her life, with the changes in terms of the gender revolution. So we know that uh, uh, women are, um, since uh, many decades, since 50 decades, in, uh, for five, five decades, uh, has entered uh, the high level of, uh, of education and also have an increased uh, level of uh, participation in the labor market. And this is what uh, can be called the first half uh, of the gender revolution. So women enter uh, uh, the public spheres and um, this is in partly, um, is pa partially uh, due to the fact that they had less children, but on the other hand, it's also possible that 
um, the idea of, uh, of entering the public sphere is uh, a strategy to do that is to reduce uh, uh, fertility levels. So this is the first part of, uh, of the story. But there are many scholars now that, uh, especially focusing on uh, northern Scandinavian countries, that say that this is only the first part, but there is another part, the second part of the gender revolution, where, in theory at least, um, fertility levels can increase. And this is uh, due to the fact that men that was not a protagonist in the first part of the gender revolution, start to enter the private sphere so they can be more and more committed in, uh, household, uh, uh, in the household spheres, so in terms of uh, unpaid work, but also in terms of childcare. So the idea is that if uh, men start uh, to be seriously involved and deeply involved, fertility levels can increase. And on the, macro, on the macro level, this can be observed now because it's true that countries like Scandinavian countries, northern countries, um, northern European countries, but also uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, countries, especially, uh, especially the US, but but also partially Canada, where, uh, where um, uh, gender uh, equity is, uh, has increased, also fertility is uh, at least at the replacement level. While other countries where gender inequality seems to be more dipped, uh, that uh, total fertility rates are very, uh, are very low. So there will be a change. Let's, uh, let's uh, try to investigate a little bit uh, together what happened, what's happening in, uh, in Italy and what is the involvement of fathers. Before to do that, uh, well, let's uh, have a look to the um, total fertility uh, trends. And uh, one of the characteristics uh, of the of, of fertility rates uh, in Italy, as uh, this morning uh, um, uh, Linda Laura uh, anticipated, that uh, from the middle, the, from the, the so-called baby boom in the mid of the 60s, we the the the, the, the number of births uh, has uh, uh, halved, and uh, but um, and total fertility rates that uh, reached the peak in, uh, in the mid 1960s of the 1960s was 2.7, uh, reached the lowest level, one of the lowest uh, ever observed in the world of 1.19 in the mid of 90s with this rapid uh, fall. Then seems to um, there is a, a sort of of um, of of slight uh, increase that uh, was arrested partially by the economic crisis, and in the Laura this morning uh, explained very well uh, some of the mechanism. And, um, but uh, there is also uh, a reduction again of, uh, of, uh, of fertility uh, that seems uh, more or less uh, waving around 1.3. That is, uh, that means, uh, 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 0 0.7 children less than replacement level that, for instance, has been uh, reached by, by France, uh, a country that uh, presents a lot of similarities with, uh, with Italy for, for, many, for many aspects. And one of the characteristics uh, of, uh, of uh, the Italian uh, uh, fertility change is also the postponement of, uh, of mater motherhood. Uh, the average at birth is, uh, is increasing, has increased since uh, 19, uh, the 1980s. And, uh, but what is m even more important is the um, increase of the age of first birth. That is not influenced by the number of, uh, of, the, of, of children, but just uh, to the, the moment in which, uh, the, to the entry into, into motherhood, that is, is the highest uh, uh, in, in Europe together with, uh, with uh, Spain, and now it's uh, 30.7. So it's, uh, 
one uh, of the post most postponed uh, uh, transition to motherhood uh, uh, now ever observed. And um, this is as um, also, as uh, Linda Laura <laughs> said this morning, um, there is a, a big, uh, a big change uh, if we observe uh, the um, trend of fertility levels in the northern of Italy and in the south. And uh, in the north, uh, northern of Italy, fertility was lower since uh, the, um, and you reached the, the, the replacement level in the, in the, in the, in the 70s, at the end of the 60s, while the southern of Italy, and the southern of Italy has a, a, a higher uh, level of, uh, of fertility. And, uh, but uh, we, we, we see that the, 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 um, the decrease of fertility levels in the south is really, really uh, steep. And uh, um, at, uh, in the, at the middle of the, of the new, new millen millennium, we, we in the new century, uh, we noticed that uh, um, the fertility levels in, uh, in the north uh, were higher. This is in part the contribution of foreign, uh, of foreign uh, population, but not, uh, not only that. I mean, so. This is a sign of also of a crisis of, uh, of, the, of the southern of, uh, of Italy. And again, uh, here where the, in the south where the traditionalistic family seems to hold, it's this and, and also the probably gender roles that are more um, unbalanced, uh, their, the prevalence of the uh, male breadwinner family, this is no more compatible with high fertility. So the fertility levels are low in both uh, situations. Uh, in the north, where women are more involved in the labor market, and in the, in the south. And this is true also uh, for cohort fertility, not only uh, on peri period fertility. So, and... Um, Now, uh, there is um, the prevalence of uh, a family of small uh, size, and uh, we notice that uh, the two children models that uh, is still very present when, they, when uh, Italian people are asked, how many children do you want to have in your life? People will answer two kids, but we see that since uh, the cohort born in the, at the end of the 60s, this is no more, it's still the, 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 the prevailing model, but uh, it's decreasing its importance. While uh, the, the, the family of one child or even the childless uh, family seems to increase its, uh, uh, its importance. The, okay, the decrease of the, of the family uh, composed by uh, three children seems to definitely uh, almost disappearing and uh, becoming really a rare uh, family, family typology. So this is um, the, um, we will focus later on, on, on childlessness, but uh, uh, this is also, the, the, the dimension of the family that is, become, is, sh is shrinking and becoming smaller and smaller um, is also associated to the age of entrance into motherhood because we say that is one of the most delayed, delayed in, the, in the world. So uh, it, it's possible that if you start to have the, your first child when you are aged 30 and more, you not, don't have much time to reach large uh, uh, family, even if you maybe could uh, have uh, wished to do so in, uh, in the beginning. And uh, it, it's interesting uh, because um, if we consider only people, uh, only women of Italian citizenship, the age of first birth is even more than 30, is 32.3, and it increased by two years in the last decade. So. It's really uh, a, a record. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. And what is is even more impressive is that um, um, 
the, num new, the newborn by, by mothers uh, aged over 40 are now more, uh, more uh, important than uh, um, uh, births by mother less, aged less than 25. So it's really changing also the timing of, uh, of uh, births. And having kids uh, over at uh, age over 40 as this proportion has duplicated uh, in, uh, in, the last, uh, in, the, in the last decade. This can be also the effect of the crisis because of course uh, during economic crisis, during war, people postpone having children, but it's a fact that uh, um, this uh, is uh, the Italian situation in the last, uh, in the last 10 years. And of course, a consequence of, uh, of this uh, is the increase of childlessness. In this figure, you can see the proportion of uh, almost permanent childlessness level by level of education. And, uh, and the, the, the three bars are referred to, or four, it depends, <laughs> are referred to the um, uh, cohorts birth cohorts of women, and we see that uh, the proportion of, uh, of childlessness that is uh, more than, uh, is close to 30% for women uh, um, who has uh, tertiary education um, is increased, uh, but is increasing uh, regardless uh, the level of education. So, th okay, there are still differentials by education level, but we see that there is an increase uh, regardless of the education level. And what is even more impressive is what happened at age 30, 34, where uh, being childless is becoming uh, uh, more and more common. And uh, this is, uh, I think this is a, a new phenomenon because, uh, I, well, this morning uh, um, Barbara Poggio mentioned uh, the study of uh, Valeria that uh, was uh, focusing on the, the, the birth of the second child that is, uh, whose probability is lower than uh, in, in France. But I think now is be the major concern is becoming the birth, the, the birth of the first uh, uh, child because this is no more uh, given for granted in, uh, in, uh, in Italy. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, postponement uh, doesn't uh, mean necessarily that uh, you cannot uh, maybe catch up later. But it's true that if you start having kids uh, uh, after, after 35, uh, you can have more, more problems also in uh, conceiving. So the social, in other words, it's like the, the social time, the, the right moment to have children for the societies uh, are no more uh, in, in line with biology. Because, of course, a study shows that uh, the probability to have a conception within a year is a 66% per, age, at age 35, but it reduced at 44% at age 40. And uh, in addition, there's also a higher risk of miscarriages, uh, one out of five at, at age of 35. So even if uh, we have the idea that, uh, as many other choices, uh, you can decide to have a kid, a kid whenever you like and you have it, but the reality is much more complex and also, for instance, the use of uh, acetyl reproductive um, techniques that is increasing more and more uh, is also a consequence of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, postpo extreme postponement uh, transition of, uh, of fertility. But, okay. Now we have presented a little bit uh, the major changes in fertility in the last decades, but um, what can be the role of gender, gender inequalities in, uh, in these? Because this is becoming more and more a, situa a situation that is more and more similar to the 
extreme Japanese one, where women, maybe, decided to refuse uh, um, both marriage and, uh, and um, having children, because uh, uh, once they have entered the labor market and have uh, uh, granted a sort of autonomy, they don't want to become again, to, to re-enter in the traditional uh, roles that uh, um, maternity could imply. Maybe it's not like that in Italy, but we, we have to think also to this example, because it's possible that gender, gender inequalities within the household can have, uh, can have uh, some role in this. It's difficult to measure it, but uh, the, we try at least to, to make a, a reason, uh, a re, uh, to reasoning uh, uh, of it. So, we can say that there is a vicious link between gender inequality and low fertility. Uh, indeed, uh, we know that uh, uh, from uh, macro uh, relationship uh, that, uh, as I said before, where gender roles are more equal, usually le fertility levels are higher. And some study at micro level showed also that uh, where couples as a more equalitarian um, um, gender role set within the household, the probability to have kids is higher. But it's very difficult to find this uh, longitudinal data to, to, to assess this. And uh, of course, uh, what we notice in Italy that uh, the gender imbalance uh, is still uh, strong in childless couples, for instance, but it's true that uh, the implication of childbearing for gender role set usually are not so positive for women because uh, uh, mothers and fathers' time use changes not in the same uh, way because uh, uh, women become the the most uh, involved in, uh, in child care and uh, in the organization of the, of the, the complicated life <laughs> of our children. And, um, and these changes uh, can uh, be uh, even accentuated when uh, uh, the family size grows. So let's, let's give some, uh, some, uh, also some, uh, some data on it. But before doing that, uh, we must keep in mind uh, that, uh, um, well, we can, uh, we can uh, um, gender inequality can be addressed by different uh, uh, level and different perspective. Of course, the, we can call, we can talk about uh, societal gender inequalities in, in terms of political empowerment, educational opportunities. We can study it by institutional perspective, so in terms of provision of childcare, parental leave, policies, and so on. But it's interesting also to study gender equity in the household, in, in terms of the vision of labor uh, within, the, within the household, but also at individual level in terms of gender role attitudes. So we try to, um, to focus on this, uh, on this idea, so to study fairness and opportunity rather than strict equality of outcome. So, and gender equality in a, in, a fam, in, a, in a familialistic context like Italy, of course, can assume different perspective from other countries where um, families are, in a way, lighter, had a lighter, um, um, a lighter, t lighter weight, uh, and um, as I will explain um, better in a minute. Indeed, in Italy, families are required to do a lot of things, more things than in many other countries. So, families are expected to support their own members with only limited help from the state, so kids are basically a private affairs and uh, family responsibility and obligation extend uh, beyond the nuclear family. So there is uh, the, um, uh, the help, uh, the external help of grandparents or uh, siblings as well. And um, there is also a strong belief that families do it better. So maybe that is better to have uh, 
kids within uh, uh, within um, that the, the kids should stay with with the mother and not maybe in the kindergartens. Also, because there is a, a sort of mistrustful attitude towards the institutions. So I don't trust the kindergartens. Maybe I prefer to uh, to care for my for my for my kids uh, myself. Or, or it's better to give. Uh, my kids to my mother rather than to a kindergarten. So there is also a strong uh, um, an, an attitude that sometimes is mistrustful uh, towards the institution. So this is in this context, of course, it's much bit more complicated to to talk about policies and to talk about uh, gender equalities. And it's true that uh, in Italy. Uh, this femi fe familialistic uh, um, welfare sy system is um, evident when we, for instance, we measure the share of social expenditure related to family and children that is extremely low, 1.58% of GDP. Percent of GDP. And, um, and also when we when we notice that uh, um, the emphasis uh, on family needs in the political debate uh, sometimes is limited to is purely ideological and limited uh, to a definition of what is a family, what is not. But sometimes, oh, <laughs> it's working. Sometimes uh, we don't really uh, debate on 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 the policy needed to for instance, support family, support fertility, and so on. And um, the absence of, uh, of this theme, as, uh, as Linda Laura did, uh, anticipated this morning, um, we, we, the, 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 new, the new rules, uh, uh, the new law uh, in the 2000, the, the first years of 2000 seems to be a promising beginning, but uh, at the end, uh, they were just a measure that have not been um, uh, increased and uh, um, enhanced in a way. So it's not uh, um, the debate is poor in this sense in the political uh, arena, and uh, and this, as a consequence. Uh, uh, the positive thing that we have a quite solid system of family that also during the crisis uh, help a lot uh, to, uh, to support uh, the individuals. But on the end, I will, uh, I will define this family a bit hypertrophic in the sense that uh, they probably do more things uh, than uh, many other uh, European countries because uh, of, of course, uh, as maybe Everywhere is a comfortable and emotional nest, and this is uh, quite uh, common. But it becomes also a provider of a an extreme uh, um, amount of uh, extraordinary amount of goods and services of good quality, especially for both uh, the young and the old. So, um, for instance, uh, high-quality meals, that is typical of, uh, for, for just to give a, a trivial example, no? no frozen food, but uh, homemade uh, meals that are considered more, uh, more important. But as uh, Linda Laura said, uh, uh, the family is also transformed in a sort of buffer in time of crisis, for instance, in case of unemployment, in case of divorce, and um, it redistributes resources among generations, but of course, uh, to do, do ex efficiently must have some resources to dis distribute it. And during the crisis seems not to be the case anymore. And, um, it, and in Italy, this is maybe the amoral uh, familism. Uh, it becomes also a job agency, home providers, insurance agency, and so on. So to do so many things, uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of, it, it, it's time intensive. And, uh, and can you guess who will pay the, the most among, between men and women? Of course, <laughs> women. And this is an interesting graph uh, that I borrowed from uh, Marina Zannella and uh, co-authors. And uh, they try to calculate uh, the production of, 
of domestic time and the consume of domestic time using a methodology called NTA. And um, well, it's interesting that women becomes a net producer of time, uh, okay, <laughs> of time, uh, family time, since they are in their 20s, they they, 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 so they produce more time than they uh, actually consume, while men play the free riders until the age of 50, and just after 50 can be net, uh, modest net contributor of uh, uh, domestic uh, domestic time. So just to give a gen very general speak, uh, speech of this, a uh, general idea. And, um, but we see that, for instance, uh, uh, now it's much more common to have dual income uh, families, but if we, if we see the attitudes over dual income uh, families, seems to be accepted, commonly accepted. And in this graph, we see the proportion of, uh, of uh, men and women, women and men, in two, in two years, uh, at, at the beginning of the 2000 and uh, at the end of the 2000, um, in which uh, um, this is the proportion of, uh, of people agreeing that husband and wife should contribute to household income. So they agree more or less like uh, many other countries, even uh, more than, for instance, the UK. But on the other hand, so, okay, in this idea, uh, women should work, but, so the, the, the other side of the coin is that uh, we uh, notice that Italian in a large proportion, 80% in the 2000 and uh, in 2010 uh, is, 70%, so it's not changed that much, thinks that uh, a preschool child is likely to suffer if the mothers work. So the idea is, uh, okay, is, uh, dual income uh, families uh, are accepted, but on the other hand, this can cause problems and troubles uh, in, uh, with kids. So I think these, uh, these values uh, has a... Um, a role also in deciding maybe not to have children because paradoxically those uh, women who uh, decide not to have children sometimes are really those who think uh, that children uh, needs a lot of time and needs a lot of care. So it's a sort of, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's to avoid suffering so maybe can be uh, part of the strategies to renounce uh, maternity but also that uh, women has to struggle to avoid that kids, uh, to compensate. If they work, if women work, they have to compensate. So they have to dedicate a lot of time uh, for childcare, maybe a sort, as a sort of compensation. Uh, and uh, so, um, as I said, uh, with this idea, this underlying idea that uh, Families uh, needs a lot of uh, efforts uh, to because it has a lot of duties. Women support this burden, and uh, if we compare, for instance, uh, to uh, standard family couples with at least a preschool child, so uh, a sort of typology, standard typologies of uh, of um, of uh, family, we notice that to run this uh, family. Uh, it takes uh, 48 uh, weekly hours uh, spent in domestic and care activity in Sweden, while 64 in Italy. So the same typology of family uh, demands more time in Italy, apart from any gender uh, consideration. But who share these, uh, um, these duties? Uh, so the, the um, uh, 29 hours of the 48 uh, hours necessary to run a Swedish family, uh, so about 60% are performed by women, while in Italy, 80% uh, are performed by women. So this, uh, this is interesting because uh, we, you, if you notice here, um, an Italian woman living in this, uh, in this um, the same typology of, uh, of family uh, spend more time than a couple 
in uh, Sweden. So 51 hours spent by only the, a, a woman, while uh, 48 spent uh, in uh, Sweden by the, the couples on the whole. So that that's should uh, require a sort of reflection because, uh, of course, the standard can be very different. So I think, in part, uh, is also due to the fact that uh, Italian uh, women, Italian couples have the idea that you have to dedicate much more time to run a family. And um, so, uh, if we focus on, uh, on childcare, the quantity of childcare, uh, oh, I'm sorry, um, just to, to focus that uh, we, we choose this uh, typology to show it, but if we see other typologies with older children, the differences are still very important. And when children are grown up, Italian women dedicate a double amount of time than the Swedish uh, peers, 40, 40 hours per week. So still a lot of time. And, uh, and what about childcare? So um, in, this, uh, in this graph, I show you uh, um, the quantity of, uh, of childcare um, spent by uh, Italian couples according to the number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, children and, their and the age of the youngest. So we can just uh, have different typologies of families having one, two, or three or more children, and who's young, the youngest is uh, zero, two, three, five, and six, uh, 12. And for instance, uh, we see that uh, uh, the family is having one, uh, one child um, under three years old requires 4.7 hours a day of childcare on the whole, so a lot of time again. But the time reduces as the, uh, the youngest, uh, ch the, the, yeah, the child is, grows, uh, grows up, uh, up to two hours a day. That is not uh, that uh, small anyway. Uh, again, we see that uh, there is a sort of, um, there doesn't change a lot the time spent uh, on childcare when you have uh, more children, but this is because, of course, it, maybe you can uh, dedicate the same time caring more children at, uh, at once. And it's also possible there are economies of scales because uh, maybe people having more children have a more relaxed uh, uh, parenting style, or maybe other, the, the older uh, kids uh, can care the younger. So there is a different strategy probably uh, in, these, uh, in these families. But if we, if we compare this, uh, this, uh, uh, this figure with uh, another one uh, done in, uh, for France, uh, we notice that uh, Italian couples spend more time on childcare and also on paid work, and I will show you in a minute. And uh, not, well, for instance, for, uh, for the typology of, uh, of families having one child uh, under three, uh, Italian couples spend 4.7 hours a day of childcare, and uh, the, fran the friends 3.7, so one hour less. That is uh, quite uh, an important difference. But if we see also, the unpaid work that is composed by domestic uh, activities and childcare, we see again that um, uh, in the case of the childless couple, uh, in Italy, um, they spend 5.5 of unpaid work per day, and in France, 3.9. So, less, consider considerably less time. And uh, of course, uh, the time increases with uh, the number of children and increases with the age of children in both countries, but the level is still uh, lower in France and higher in, uh, uh, in, higher, and in, higher in Italy. This is, this is for the couples, but just to demonstrate <laughs> that uh, uh, there are probably 
different parenting styles requiring more time or different standard at home, for instance, uh, more attention to also to domestic uh, tasks and so on. Um, so, what about, uh, what about sharing activities, sharing care and sharing unpaid work? In the same uh, line of, of reasoning, on the same graphs I showed you before, um, I uh, compare Italy and France, and in Italy and France, men and women in different uh, typology of family, the same uh, I showed you before, according to the number of children and to the age of children. If I, I haven't forgotten to put the label, but can you guess who are the males and who are the women? We are the, I think you can. And indeed, uh, you see the Italian women uh, spending much, much more time than the French women. And uh, while uh, the situation among men is more similar. So it's, really, it's true, as, uh, as Linda Laura said, that um, men are more common, have, have a more common behavior while women, Italian women spend much more uh, time in uh, uh, unpaid work than uh, the French uh, uh, peers. It's interesting also to, to notice that uh, men uh, reduce, uh, this is um, uh, limited to housework, because uh, it's interesting to see that uh, we men, Italian men, reduce a little bit uh, uh, their housework, uh, the time dedicated to housework when they have children because uh, they increase uh, uh, childcare. And as uh, again Linda Laura said, that they usually choose and scream off the cream and uh, do the more pleasant uh, activities, like, for instance, going to see the football uh, <laughs> game with the kids and so on. But they do that and they reduce a little bit uh, uh, childcare. But it's true also for women that reduce uh, uh, housework to increase uh, um, uh, childcare. These are, I, I haven't told because I didn't want to get into the methodology, but these are estimates uh, controlling for a series of characteristics. Uh, so um, we control also for a different level of participation in the labor market in Italy and France and men and women. So we have a sort of standard family in, this, uh, in these figures. And uh, what is interesting again is that uh, we know that in a in a post-materialist uh, society, uh, uh, children compete uh, with, uh, other, with other uh, activities, maybe, and the time dedicated to kids can uh, compete with other activities, for instance, uh, time spent in leisure time. And so we try to calculate uh, the impact of, uh, of a kid in, uh, uh, for leisure time. That can be considered a sort of cost of, of kids in terms uh, of children in terms of uh, uh, in a sort of opportunity cost of, uh, of children. And uh, here, uh, in this graph, we presented a daily reduction of free time in hours, um, according, again, to different typologies. So the, the, the reference in this case is the child is couple. When a kid is present in the family, the reduction of, uh, of uh, leisure time for women, is, for instance, is two hours, more or less two hours a day, when uh, kids are, are very young, under three, and uh, uh, it's, it's become more moderated when the kids uh, are, uh, when there is one kid but uh, older. And we see that uh, the reduction uh, increases, even if economies of scales are present again, um, but increase with the uh, family size. So kids has uh, an impact that is, ooh, okay, that has a, a, a very strong, um, a very strong uh, uh, impact, uh, so, sorry, um, has an, um, uh, the impact of, of, a, of children on leisure time is much more uh, important for, for women than, uh, than for, for men. 
other things being equal, so also level of, of uh, labor market participation. Um, the cost of children is prolonged and gender inequality is transmitted because we consider also adult uh, kids uh, uh, in, um, that uh, live with their uh, parents. So adults means 1835, so really adults. It's interesting to notice that uh, uh, the share of, of household domestic time uh, performed by men, by adult uh, men living with their parents, is 5.4%, and only 42% of, of, uh, of uh, these uh, men children living with their parents uh, do a, at least one activity uh, per day, while the participation for women is much more general, and not so important, but uh, much more important because it's 16 0.5% of the total uh, uh, domestic work. Um, okay, and uh, in France uh, the, there is uh, still a difference, but uh, the, the, the situation is much more equalitarian. So, um, I, I, I will skip some, sorry, some, uh, <laughs> I have too, too many things to say, but, um, um, so, I, my, my question is, uh, how will be the system sustainable in the future? I mean, there is a growing demand for care and assist, there will be a growing demand for care and assistance for the elderly. This, is, this country is one of the most aged in the world. The family continues to follow traditional models, but it's true that uh, it's a matter of fact that women have contrasting of aspirations. And um, moreover, as uh, Linda Laura anticipated, uh, um, uh, active aging policies can threaten the system of intergenerational transfer within the family. So maybe grand, uh, grandmothers are more and more involved in the labor market uh, and less eager to become uh, per uh, permanent, uh, perform the grandmother's role. Um, so, who can substitute women? The welfare, but is constrained by the debt, so in part yes, but in part no. The market, for instance, foreign carers, babysitters, and so on, but uh, has a limit, and is costly, in a way. I think the answer could be men. Men, in the, so to complete the second half of the gender revolution, and to do so, of course, uh, maybe policies can have a role. And so I think gender policies are not an option uh, to support family and, uh, and, uh, uh, family and fertility too. Uh, so the idea that family policy and labor policies and must be accompanied by gender policies, otherwise uh, uh, without this explicit attention, uh, to gender issues, all the ma other measuring encourages uh, women labor market participation becomes a, bo a boomerang for, for women, maybe creating discrimination. So the idea that family policy should be present, but present not only for women, but also for men. And, uh, and today, th this morning, uh, we, we, we learned that uh, only very uh, limited number of, of men uh, um, take uh, the leave that are compulsory in theory leave, and uh, this is a sign of uh, okay uh, that this necessary that policy should be clearly targeted, consistent, and maybe imaginative. So there are a lot of examples. I, I have no much time to, to to get into that, but I think uh, uh, that. Um, Paternity leaves, uh, a serious paternity leave should be, that should be um, compulsory, not only in theory, but also in practice, should be useful because uh, in a Scandinavian country it worked. If you, in, in a sense, uh, make it really compulsory, otherwise you lose it. Maybe fathers can be encouraged to do that and uh, employ, employees uh, should uh, accept that. 
the increasing remuneration of parental leave because uh, if the man income is still the higher in, in the family, it, it's difficult that fathers can renounce and the family can uh, can um, have, have um, lose it. <laughs> Sorry, and um, then flexible time schedules should be not only for mothers but for both partners. Like, for instance, in the Netherlands, we can maybe have some hints from different countries. And then, the last but not the least, educate men to be fathers, as fatherhood cannot be considered more an optional, but... Uh, and uh, from the, 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 new, the new data on, on it, uh, we have uh, some clues that men love staying with their, with their kids. So, I mean, can be also uh, not uh, a punishment, but also a, a way to empower them uh, in, a, in a different way. So, just really um, to remember the, um, the um, <laughs> um, Valeria's uh, motto, come on girls, let's work. I would turn a little bit on this time on, come on boys, let's work, because we see that women work a lot. Let's put into focus also the men. Do you have questions, comments? Okay, I have one and then... Uh, it's... It, it was actually the woman in, however you call it, it's not pink, but something similar. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Ulla Forset. I am from Norway. I'm a professor currently visiting at Trento. Um, I wanted to tell you that like 50 years ago in the 70s, you seldom saw a man on the street with the pram like strolling with the kids. Nowadays, that is very usual, and uh, that is because we have parental leave, and we have a quota for the fathers. As you know, we were the first country in the world to introduce that. And so if the father doesn't take these days, uh, the family will lose the date. So it's been very important, uh, and it has also affected the division of labor in the family. the man, uh, but it's also the uh, state and how each time the number of weeks for the fathers ha have been increased. You see that more uh, fathers are taking this opportunity. And so it's like a right, so they don't have to in a way uh, negotiate with uh, um, their employers. So. In this way, this enforced days, or maybe we could say the caring push from the state has been helping a lot. So a lot of things have changed. Uh, of course, we have the kind of Nordic model where we emphasize the work line and also to liberate the individual. Uh, so I uh, wanted to know, or I would like to ask you, do you think that this kind of mindset that the state comes in as uh, an important and uh, makes intervention would be possible in Italy, that uh, the political parties or uh, the state would interfere. And of course, we also have like full coverage of kindergarten. So I was wondering, is that a, a possible scenario? <laughs> Thank you. I would like uh, to see, maybe to meet uh, in 50 years to see whether <laughs> the things uh, will change uh, in Italy as in Norway. But I think that 
one of the point uh, is that uh, the, the idea of familialistic uh, attitudes uh, um, doesn't make uh, these themes uh, central in the political programs and so on. So uh, also we, are, uh, we have an election in, uh, in one, uh, one month uh, and uh, I think this, uh, this topic disappeared while in the end of 19th uh, seems uh, to be more in the agenda. Now I think uh, everybody talks about migration but uh, so I, and people really didn't struggle for get uh, these uh, rights. So I don't think, I'm not so optimistic, uh, apart from the academic. Uh, yeah, I, yeah I, I don't think it's central. I would now like to collect questions and leave the answer to the end of it, okay? Uh, well, I, my name is Paola Villa. Uh, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. I just want to, uh, I will just uh, make a small comment and a question on, on uh, I think on your concluding points about policies. I think it's really a di very difficult issue. And so, uh, there's just a small point you didn't, uh, you didn't mention. Anyway, it's very rich so you cannot do any, everything. I'm always, uh, uh, well, at the very end, you mentioned policies. And you mentioned the role of the state, the role of fathers, uh, the role of uh, something, employers. But we don't, do not discuss the position of women. So when you, um, in, the, uh, in the grass where you were talking about time, it was very interesting. But I was stuck because you have, you know, the difference between Italy and France is very illuminating. Why in Italy women do spend so much time doing the same things that women in France do? And I suppose that this, uh, the, uh, the figure here adjusted for individual characteristics. Well, this reminds me of a very old research, American research, and we are looking about the introduction of a uh, washing machine in the US. Oh, every, everybody thought, oh good, very innovative uh, technological change, a big change. You just have a machine, you put your dirty clothes and you put in and then you just put, uh, drop them out, saving a lot of time. No, because people start, instead of washing once a week, or once uh, every two weeks, uh, just w making the, uh, the washing machine working so many times, so you have to put out the, the clothes and then iron the clothes, so you can just fill your time doing the same thing, but not once, but two times, three times. And I think a lot of the difference here has to do with the cultural attitudes of Italian women compared to French women. What to do with that? I think we have to do, consider also, among other things, and this is complex, the choices made by women. Why do they stuck to this very traditional model? If you live in a couple, you also have to make some compromise on the standards. Mm -hmm. Washing, or like, what, how do you explain the case in Italy of uh, women in uh, Emilia Romagna? very few children, high, very high uh, participation rates, better salaries than any other place in Italy, but no children. They just stay there washing uh, the floor, washing. <laughs> so I, I think it's a, I'm, an, I'm an economist, so this is not my topic, but I would like somebody telling me why this cultural attitude is not changing, despite I guess we will else. dedicate the next plenary to this then. <laughs> <laughs> Daniela, very quickly, please. Uh, my comment is very close to the one of Paula. I was also wondering why there is uh, this big uh, difference and uh, I was wondering if you have any information on um, how often people have uh, help in their houses, so maybe they have uh, 
uh, house makers, uh, or maybe they also have more machines. I don't uh, they like the, the machine to dry clothes. I mean, maybe there is something in terms of which may explain that. I mean, we know that uh, as economists that uh, wages per hour in Italy are lower, so that can also affect what you can afford to pay afterwards. Okay, um, my job is to, to keep the time, okay? I would have plenty of questions, especially, I mean, not, not exactly with regard to the description of the situation, which we think, I mean, it's pretty clear. The question is why? I think the first intervention made an important point, and I don't ask you to answer on that because we will leave that for another coffee break or so. Uh, there is a reason of why um, gender equity or equality is so much higher in the northern part, and that is because there's welfare. But I leave my comment to that, and then Maria, Letizia, quickly, please. Because the light, I mean, the, the questions are, 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 are the difficult ones because uh, I think culture has a, a big part in uh, explaining these uh, differences and, uh, and it's very difficult to, to measure. We controlled for external aids, we controlled for a lot of things, uh, for labor market participation, for uh, also the area of residence, we controlled for many things. We cannot control very well from cultural attitudes. I think, well, we, we discussed with uh, my French colleague uh, from, uh, from INED, and they say, oh, but you have, uh, for instance, uh, marble in your house. And we don't, we don't, we don't like it. <laughs> I mean, there are some, some aspects also in the, our domestic, uh, you, you mentioned domestic uh, washing machines, uh, and uh, I compare this data with the American one, and the time uh, spent in preparing food is nothing, and the washing, uh, washing um, uh, doing the washing up is nothing because they just throw, throw it away, they go in a take away, and, and this is not part of our culture, so maybe this is part, we, the problem is that we don't have to cancel all the differences, uh, but to understand if these differences are becoming an obstacle to, for instance, to realize uh, maybe fertility preferences or other, or labor market, the participate, full labor market participation and so on. If this culture, uh, uh, attitudes uh, uh, limit also the, the desires of women. If they behave different from the French one, from the American one, I mean, it's possible. But if it's possible, men should care more because uh, the standard should be shared and it is not. So, so this is a... Uh, if we say we want to dedicate a lot of time in doing, uh, in working at home, this should be shared at least, and this is not the case. So, thank you, thank you. Pleasure of listening to the remaining three. Um, finalists, the persons who have been selected. I assure you that the selection of a winner among these four was not at all easy. Um, all papers that, well, all papers that we were reading were on very high levels. I think, let's say, the quality gap between our papers that we are listening to now is not very big. Um, so, yeah, I'm really curious and looking forward to these presentations and I'm inviting Stefano Cantalini, who is going to present us a paper of Does the Birth of a Child Affect Career Equally? And it is in many ways complementary to the presentation that we heard from the day, from in this morning. And we also said in the, in the coffee break, we also said that it might be a very good idea to circulate the various presentations among our junior presenters, because I really think they have to, something to say to each other. Um, Stefano holds a PhD in sociology um, from Milan University, where he currently has a postdoc position. So to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, 
I'm very pleased to be to be here. Uh, it's a honor for me to present here at the conference in memory of uh, of Valeria Sulezin, and thanks very much to the scientific committee for having selected my my contribution. This contribution is uh, about uh, um, the differences in uh, uh, parenthood effects uh, across different groups of the society, especially focusing on differences according to education, timing of parenthood, on uh, occupational careers. And we especially focus on, uh, on Italy. Let me start from the main uh, motivation, uh, aims and contribution of my, of my work that stems from, uh, from a literature on uh, the fact that basically parenthood is a key life course uh, transition that uh, affects uh, individual careers uh, and shapes uh, gender inequalities, usually leading to job interruptions uh, and occupational downgrading for women, whereas it increases incentives to work uh, and leads to occupational upgrading for men. This is especially true in, uh, in a country such as Italy because of different uh, structural and cultural characteristics. Uh, we have uh, uh, scarce uh, public childcare services. Uh, we have uh, poorly par paid parental leaves. Uh, we also have uh, almost uh, only for mothers compulsory maternity leave. We have limited part-time jobs opportunities and more in general we have uh, social and cultural norms that still consider women as the main, when not the only, caregiver in, uh, in the family. However, we think that uh, parenthood career penalties, as well as premia, might, different, might be different according to different groups in the society. For instance, we think that high educated women might have stronger career aspiration and higher economic resources and other characteristics that maybe help them to decrease their motherhood penalties with respect to low educated. However, few studies in the past has focused on studying how parenthood effects differ according to variables such as education. So our first aim, our first contribution is to study motherhood and fatherhood effects on occupational careers in Italy, especially focusing and studying if and how these career penalties and premium change according to education. Second, this literature I was talking about has mainly studied these topics from a static perspective, estimating the average effect of becoming parent on occupational careers. So our second aim and contribution is to analyze educational differences in the impact of parenthood from a dynamics perspective. Basically, we follow individuals across their occupational careers and look at their premia or penalties in the short term and in the long term. Finally, our work aims to investigate the effect of timing of parenthood on occupational trajectories. And this is very crucial if we talk about educational differences, because we all know that also in Italy, high educated people are more likely to postpone first birth. And if this is true, and if postponement of parenthood is beneficial for future careers, then it is possible that it would also contribute to increase the social inequalities over the life course. As I said before, the theoretical background mainly stems from the literature on motherhood penalties and uh, fatherhood premia, showing that uh, um, parenthood decreases female labor supply and increases male labor supply. In turn, these uh, will also affect uh, um, occupational careers. For instance, we know that for women, there will be a negative effect on both the short-term and long-term occupational success. This is partially related to um, a loss of seniority, a skill depreciation, transition to mother-friendly jobs, negative evaluation of uh, mothers by employers. And on the other side, we know that uh, the increase in male labor supply uh, related to parenthood, that is actually mainly related to marriage for men, further increases their occupational success, basically because it favors their productivity and also favors their 
positive evaluation among the employers. So basically, what we... I'm sorry. Okay, so first of all, uh, we hypothesize that uh, on average there is a negative effect on, uh, of parental and occupational careers for women and a slightly not significant but a slightly positive effect for, uh, for men. Concerning differences by education, uh, we expect actually that uh, there are not crucial differences according to education among men, whereas we expect uh, uh, strong differences among women. Especially we can think that uh, high education might help women to stay attached to the labor market shortly and long after motherhood, as well as to maintain their pre-motherhood occupation and avoid episodes of career mobility. We think that uh, education, high education, can give some protective factors for women. First of all, there is uh, the occupation, before uh, motherhood, there is usually a more qualified and more protected occupation with respect to low educated. There are also higher opportunity costs to long career breaks for uh, high educated people, high educated women especially. There are also some uh, preferences, some uh, values, some roles for high educated that can be alternative to those prevalent in the Italian society looking at mother, considering mothers and women as the main caregiver in the family. Okay? And also there is uh, some studies have shown that there is, uh, according to the mechanism of, of uh, educational homogamy, high educated women are more likely to um, be married with uh, high educated men that usually are more likely to share family responsibilities with, uh, with their partners. Concerning the timing of parenthood, the previous research has shown that postponing first childbearing is beneficial for both male careers and female careers. And we expect that this benefit, this benefit of postponing is especially true among high educated in Italy. This is, for instance, because for uh, high educated women, it leads to enter the uh, career tracks typical of high educated that will in the future act, as I said before, as some protective and beneficial factors for not leaving the labor market and not experiences occupational downgrading. So how we uh, try to reach these aims and uh, contribution? We use data from the multi-purpose survey, family and social actors. We use the survey of 2009 collected by the Italian, Italian Statistical Institute. We transform this data in retrospective data, longitudinal data, and we focus on an analytical sample of cohorts born between 1931 and 1980 that we follow from their first job up to the 20th years in the labor market. So we select all the people that have at least one job episode, and then we follow over their 20 years in the labor market. We have a sample of around 10,000 men and 7,000 women. Our main dependent variable that basically measure occupational career is the standard international occupational prestige score. It is a numerical variable that in our data goes from the value of 18, that is basically for uh, laborers, assembly laborers, up to 70, that is uh, uh, related to the prestige of, for instance, uh, a CEO in large firms or a dentist. It's interesting that we decided to um, estimate the so-called unconditional model. So we include individuals regardless of their employment. Okay, so we do not drop uh, people leaving labor market after having a child because we are interested to look at the role of career interruptions on uh, occupational career. We have two independent variables. Uh, they are used alternatively. First of all, we have a simple uh, time-varying dummy that becomes equal to one when the individual has the first child. And then we use 
a variable measuring the years since the birth of the first child. We also control for the main time variable that is basically work experience, but also including, as I said before, years outside uh, occupation, outside employment. We control for education, for enrollment, and also for the social class of the partner, also including inactive or unemployed that cannot be unfortunately distinguished, as well as for not being in a union. We estimate uh, linear panel models uh, with uh, fixed effect that is quite uh, common in this kind of literature, and they basically help to control for the bias of uh, unobserved heterogeneity, and we estimate model separately for men and for women. We divided the, our empirical strategy, our analytical strategy, in three main parts. First of all, we estimate the average parenthood effect on occupational careers, both in general and uh, according to education. Then we mainly focus on differences by education and on differences across the life course, across the occupational career. First of all, we look at this effect over the life course, and then we look, finally, at the estimation of timing of parenthood on occupational careers. If you're interested, we can discuss later the model specification. Now I try to go on to show you the results. So starting from the first part of the uh, analytical strategy, this table shows how occupational careers on average change when the individual have the first child. We estimate three models. The first only controls for zeros in the labor market, the second also for the educational variables, and the third control for the social class of the partner. And we can clearly see that there is a very small positive effect for men that disappears if we control for information on the partner. This is mainly relating not to the occupation of the partner, actually, but to the partnership status, because marriage and parenthood are strongly correlated to each other. Whereas for women, there is a clear penalization of occupational careers after parenthood. And this is mainly related to uh, career interruptions, since we are including the uh, individuals, the episodes also outside the employment. This figure basically shows the effect of parenthood according to education. We include an interaction of uh, uh, between the main time variables and uh, the main independent variables and education. And we can clearly see that uh, there is uh, basically no differences according to education among men, where there is a clear educational gradient among women, where low educated uh, experience a penalty that is on average more than three uh, points in the pre prestige scale, whereas high educated women basically have less than one point that is also not statistically significant. Turning to the second part of the uh, analytical strategy, uh, this figure shows how occupational trajectories uh, uh, changes um, over the life course, over the occupational careers. We have, uh, say, childless people, and then we have uh, those who become uh, father in an hypothetical scenario of becoming, having the first child eight years after labor market entry. It's just an hypothetical scenario. But we can clearly see that uh, there are not so many differences among men, although a small, a small fatherhood penalty appears uh, among uh, tertiary educated later in the occupational careers. But this is more evident uh, for uh, uh, for women, basically, because we can see that uh, there is a persistent occupational penalty after motherhood among low educated and also medium educated, whereas uh, having a high education, a tertiary education, basically protect women and make them to have uh, very small differences across the life course with respect to childless people. Finally, this last uh, um, part of the analytical stat strategy studies the timing of parenthood. And basically here I divided the sample and the analysis in, in two parts. 
In the first, that is the upper panel, I compare childless people with those who have a child below the uh, average distance before, between entering the labor market and the year of parenthood. So we can consider them as early parent. And I take three years after labor market as the main, as an hypothetical scenario. In the second part, I get the late parents and use 12 years after labor market as the hypothetical scenario. And we can see that there are not differences among men according to timing of parenthood, okay, among low educated people, whereas it seems that postponing first birth is beneficial for high educated men. You can see that there is a premia in the lower panel, whereas there is a even small um, penalty among tertiary educated who have the first child early. This is much more clear also for women because we find that there is a persistent penalty that does not differ according to timing of parenthood among low educated, whereas postponing for women, for high educated women is much more beneficial. You can see that there are not differences for late first birth among tertiary educated. So, to conclude, we have shown that on average, parenthood basically does not uh, significantly affect the occupational careers of men, whereas it strongly negatively affects the uh, careers of women. This is mainly driven by job interruptions, by career interruptions. Second, we have shown that parenthood effects do not change according to education among men, but they are strongly different according to education among women. We find a largest penalty among low educated, whereas among high educated, there are some protective factors that help them to stay attached to the labor market and avoid occupational downgrading. Finally, we have also shown that according to timing of parenthood, postponing parenthood is much more beneficial for high educated, both men and women, whereas there are not systematic differences according to time among low educated. If I have one minute, uh, do, do I, okay? Uh, I can give you some uh, um, possible implication of my results. First of all, uh, we have confirmed that parenthood shapes uh, gender inequalities in Italy since first birth, uh, creates basically disadvantages only for women that accumulate into persistent penalties over the life course, over the career. So we suggest in order to reduce gender inequalities, some policy measures that are, for instance, the expansion of public childcare services, the extension of paternity leave, both immediately after parenthood, but also when the mother comes back to work, compulsory paternity leave, and incentivation to get a real alternation of parental leaves among fathers and mothers. Obviously, we think that in order to be, to, for this measure to be actually, to, to be really successful, as we said also this morning, we need something like a cultural change that interpret these strategies of real alternation among parent, among partners, not as disadvantages for, for men, but beneficial for women as for the society. Finally, we have shown that parenthood and its timing also contribute to increase social inequalities because it accumulates the penalties that are related to uh, parenthood basically accumulate for women to those disadvantages that are already shaped at the labor market entry for low educated women. So we think that those policy measures that uh, I discussed before can be can help, can operate as new protective factors for those low educated women that at least desire or need to balance to conciliate family and work. And I really thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. There are at least two additional very important results in your speak which, on which you certainly did not correctly, did not focus on, and that is the gender gap in 
this occupational prestige that sometimes you saw, there was that big jump between men and women, and the second one is the low returns to education when he was comparing levels of education on the average. So, but okay, questions, comments? The microphone is arriving. Uh, only a question. Uh, what about household income? Uh, <laughs> this would, can I answer? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, this would be uh, something really important, but... Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, this could be something really important, but unfortunately, uh, the data I use, uh, the multi-purpose survey, has not uh, information on uh, any kind of, uh, of income, unfortunately. Uh, it would be really interesting to look at uh, income in general and also as household income also to uh, go through the role of, uh, of the family, basically, of the partner and so on. Uh, uh, one minute. Because of looking at uh, your results, I was thinking that uh, educated women, maybe uh, living in couple with an educated men, so they have high income compared to the other middle and low educated, uh, so they can buy services. Yes, absolutely. This is something that it's, it's an interpretation that I can give to why there is a premium, there is a, sorry, there is a lower motherhood penalty for them because for instance it is possible that they have not only higher opportunity cost but they have first of all higher economic resources to afford the market-based childcare but also they are more likely to be married with um, higher educated men because of the mechanism of educational homogamy that is quite strong here in Italy uh, where higher educated men maybe are more likely, first of all, to share family responsibilities, but they have also higher economic resources to um, afford, the, afford to buy, basically, uh, childcare services in the private sector, or maybe in babysitter, something like that. Okay, Gabriella? Um, a brief comment. Do you control for the economic conditions at the time of labor market entry? Because I think that um, on your results of how much you need to postpone the first birth after you entered, the, the macroeconomic conditions are very important. Okay. And uh, related to this, I think that uh, uh, your results show that you know, highly educated women should wait at least 12 years, right? After labor market entry before getting the first child. And we just discussed that uh, the age at first birth is a bit too high in Italy. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that there is a problem there. Yeah. No, 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 not with the results. <laughs> I mean, with uh, the implications of these results. Okay, for the concern the first part, uh, I completely agree with you. I did not uh, actually include uh, um, information about uh, macroeconomic condition. Uh, but concerning the second part, uh, actually, I just maybe I did not uh, explain uh, very well in the um, in the presentation because this is uh, um, these are just uh, hypothetical scenarios. Uh, I decided to um, get uh, two different scenarios concerning those who become uh, parent early. I get those who become parent three years, but it's just. I can tell you that uh, this result would have been exactly the same uh, if we chose uh, five uh, or two, despite the fact that uh, you can see effects uh, that are longer in the life course. And the same uh, uh, happened for the, those who become father or mother 12 years after first birth. Because basically what I did here is to um, divide the sample according to the distance, uh, the average distance, uh, between when they enter in the labor market and when they uh, have the first child. That is on average uh, um, eight years for men, for women, sorry, and nine years for, uh, for men, for, for men, yes. Uh, and um, 
So basically, I just decided to uh, take 12 years. I know that is maybe it's not a, actually there is a five percent of uh, men and women having uh, the first child 12 years after labor market entry. But actually, um, percentages and proportion does not differ too much uh, um, according to the year after parenthood. So for instance, uh, we have something like a normal distribution for this kind of, uh, for this kind of variable because uh, the largest part uh, of the sample, both among high educated and low educated, concentrate to have the first child uh, around uh, uh, nine, 10 years. So, so I think that uh, taking the average is a good choice. And 12, as I, tell, as I told, is just a hypothetical scenario. Okay. But still, I mean, if you're having a PhD and you should, you say, if you want to get around the, the child penalty in terms of occupational progression, you should wait some eight, 12 years. Maybe it's not the case if you want to have some children. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Okay, so if there are no other comments, Paolo, quickly. You are considering the labor, are considering the labor market as a whole, but what about a dualized labor market? What, what happens if she is precariously employed? Did you run separate analysis? Or you don't, I mean, you should have enough cases, as a matter of fact. Uh, you mean... Uh, um, you mean separate analysis according? Yeah, it's something that I can do. Yes, I, I did not try a robustness checks, but it's something that. Uh... Okay. Yes, of course we do know that for precarious situations the penalty is even. Yeah, the story is always that about the accumulation of already existing disadvantages, especially in a context yes, like this, the Italian one. Yes, sure. Okay. This could be also interesting to see if what happens uh, over the life course if you place in a specific occupation at the beginning, maybe also. Perfect. Thank you very much. And we move on to the presentation of Daniela Piazzalungo, um, who holds a PhD in economics from tu Turin University. She is, as I learned before, no longer postdoc researcher at IRWAP, <laughs> but in the meantime moved to Verona. So certainly a career of uh, high occupational mobility, though not in terms of occupation so far. <laughs> And she's going to present us a paper with the title Till Money As Do Part, Property Division and Divorce in Married Couples' Time Use Behavior. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, organizing this very nice uh, event uh, and also for selecting my paper among the, the finalists. I'm really very glad. And uh, I don't think this is necessary in this um, uh, Among Us world work on these topics, but I really would like to stress that all what we are talking about are not just number, but probably every woman you, met, you meet uh, is thinking about her choice, is thinking to should I postpone a year more or I'm getting too old to have a child. If she's an old woman, maybe she's thinking should I take a part time to take care of my grandchildren or of my grandma, of my mother. So it's really a matter of choice uh, that uh, women, uh, women are taking every day of their life. Okay, so um, in this paper, uh, let's put some, some things into context. Uh, divorce laws introduced in the 60s and in the 70s uh, made divorce easier. That means that uh, uh, in the case of Italy, for instance, divorce was legalized. In the case of uh, US or France, they introduced the so-called uh, unilateral divorce, which means that only one spouse of the two can file for a divorce, so can ask for a divorce without the consent of the other. And uh, economists have shown that uh, this has increased, uh, uh, this had an effect on marriage rates and on divorce rates. It was not the only um, factor playing a role, but as you can see in this period, and in particular at the time of making divorce easier, there was an increase in divorce rates. 
And uh, making divorce easier, and given that divorce was really increasing, it can be considered uh, a so-called credible threat. That means that uh, uh, if as a partner I say you, uh, I, will, uh, I will divorce, uh, this, this is something that uh, it's really likely to happen. And uh, divorce, so divorce laws which make divorce, which make divorce easier, also affect the behavior of married people. Um, and this is something maybe we are not so used to think of, but uh, it has been shown that uh, making divorce easier increased the female labor supply, it reduced fertility and marriage specific investments, it increased household savings, and it reduced domestic violence. So in this context, uh, my research question is, uh, how does the division of assets at divorce affect the behavior of married people? So what does, uh, what does this mean? Uh, divorce law regulates not only uh, upon which basis the, the couple can file for a divorce, but also how the property will be split by the couple in case of a dissolution, dissolution of the marriage. Uh, the main uh, um, regime are the separation property regime in which the couple split uh, the, the property accumulated during the marriage according to the person who hold, really old that asset into her uh, account. Uh, the community property regime instead is the most widespread in European countries and has a, basically a 50% split of what has been accumulated during the marriage. And uh, this is considered a way to recognize uh, the role of the woman in the formation of the family wealth, even though this may happen through domestic work or care work uh, and uh, not really through the labor supply. Um, and finally, there is the so-called equitable distribution, which is common in, um, in common law states like uh, the UK or some um, US states, in which uh, the discretion, uh, discretion is left to the judge. And uh, the underlying theoretical framework for uh, researching into this topic are the non-unitary models of the household. The first model, so before the non-unitary models, the one developed by Becker was a unitary model in which uh, the couple was considering to uh, make choices uh, as a unity. Um, this model was a uh, challenge and was, uh, um, uh, after, uh, afterwards, uh, other models were developed. And uh, in these uh, non-unitary models, the focus is on the bargaining power in which the idea is that each spouse can, um, can decide for his own, even if taking into account uh, uh, the, the choice or the preferences of the other spouse, but uh, the choice is individual, and the focus is on the bargaining power. So really on the power that uh, the, each spouse has in the, in the couple. Uh, Chiapori and Kotos uh, has uh, considered the community property as a redistribution of assets toward the financially weaker spouse, which is most, in most cases is the wife. Um, because it will increase her bargaining power. So uh, if the, the marriage ends, she will be entitled to a larger share of, uh, of assets. So this causes an increase of her, her, her bargaining power even during the marriage. And this will lead to a reduction in women labor supply, as long as labor supply can be considered as utility, and an increase of men labor supply, even if the second channel is less, uh, uh, is less clear. And there has been some, empir some empirical findings uh, which show that uh, really there is a reduction of women labor supply in the case of a community property regime. Uh, in addition to that, uh, um, Fisher showed that, uh, shows that under a community property regime, there should be also incentive to increase uh, um, uh, to increase marriage-specific investments. So considering this uh, theoretical background, my contribution uh, relies to the fact that uh, there has been no research on different outcomes up to date. So the question is, what are women doing with the time they spare from the, they spare from the labor supply? And are they really increasing investments within the marriage? And the focus will be, in addition to the labor supply, also on uh, housework time and on childcare. Unfortunately, I don't have childcare time, so I will consider child, the probability of being mainly responsible for childcare. 
So uh, my identification strategy rely on a, relies on a quasi-natural experiment uh, in which I use uh, a, um, a reform which was introduced in, in England and Wales. In England and Wales, uh, the equitable distribution is usually ruled with a need-based approach, which mainly is a separation property regime, taking into account the need of the wife and eventually of the children, but basically a separation regime. Um, in October 2000, they introduced the so-called uh, white versus white, there was the so-called white versus white case, in which uh, the yardstick of equality was introduced, and basically there was the introduction of a 50% split of the family wealth in case of a dis dissolution of the marriage. Um, at the same time, Scotland had a separate jurisdiction which was not concerned by this change. So in Scotland, we have a community property regime all over the entire period. So the methodology I apply is a standard difference in difference uh, in which uh, the focus, uh, so the dependent variables are the hours of work and the probability of being employed for the labor supply, uh, the hours of housework and the probability of performing specific housework chores, and the probability of being mainly responsible for children under 12. Um, the coefficient of, in, of interest is the coefficient is beta one, as the coefficient associated with being in the post-reform period and being treated. And I also include a, set, uh, a small set of control variables plus in year fixed effects and region fixed effects. Uh, in a second specification, I include individual fixed effects, which accounts for the uh, individual hetero, uh, unobserved heterogeneity. And uh, I also estimate heterogeneous effect uh, using the level of education as a proxy for being in a more affluent couple. Uh, we may think that only more affluent couple are um, affected by this type uh, of, uh, of reform because, for two reasons. First of all, uh, um, poorer family in relative term may not have enough wealth to split at the end of the marriage. So in most cases, they, they only have the, the house and they don't have enough accumulated wealth. And uh, moreover, it's also less likely that they can afford to reduce or to change their global supply. They are more constrained. And okay, I have also estimated the effect over time for the entire period between 1992 and 2005. And uh, the year before the reform are useful to, to verify that there was no effect before the reform, so until 2000, um, until 1999, while after the reform we can see for how long the effect are at place. So the control variable which are introduced are uh, the age and the education level of the spouse and of the partner. Uh, the number of children and total income in the family, and uh, regional, um, the female unemployment rate at regional level, and the urban dummy. Uh, the data I use is the panel for 1991-2008 uh, um, in the UK, and I focus on the years 1992-2005. I stopped in 2005 because afterwards there was another reform which may affect uh, the behavior of, of Scottish people and I don't want my control group to be affected uh, by other changes. And I focus on married women and men between uh, 18 and 50 years old. So the most important assumption in a difference in different setting in the, is the common trends assumption which means that uh, the treated group and the control group should follow a common trend before the reform to be sure that after the reform what we are estimated are not the differences between the group but are really the effect of the reform. And as you can see between uh, England and Scotland, which are the red and the blue line, uh, there was an increasing trend uh, in terms of hours worked in both cases and uh, the fitted line are really parallel which stopped in, 90, in 1999, and afterwards there was a, a, a reduction, basically a, a completely flat line in England, while the increasing trend is keeping on in Scotland. On the other hand, Wales, which is the green one, has a, complete, had a completely different trend already before the reform. So for this reason, I exclude Wales from my analysis. So the same is true for hours of housework, with the exception of 1992 and 1993, 
uh, which uh, are those excluded from my analysis. So as descriptive evidence, we see that uh, the number of our, uh, the hours of housework performed by women were decreasing until 1999, both in Scotland and Wales, and afterwards uh, the trends uh, separate in both countries. And finally, for the probability of being mainly responsible for children under 12, unfortunately, this is uh, uh, less precisely estimated, so you can see that there is a lot of uh, much more uh, variation, in particular in Scotland. Uh, but again, we see that the trend of um, the probability of being mainly responsible for children uh, was uh, decreasing, both in uh, Scotland and in England, while after 1999, in England, there is an increase among married women of being mainly responsible for children, while in Scotland this is not the case. Uh, so just to be clear, the other option are that uh, the husband is mainly responsible, uh, that uh, the couple is uh, sharing the responsibility, or other people, external people, are mainly responsible. So uh, the results show that... <laughs> <laughs> in terms of hours worked, there has been a reduction of about two hours and a half, uh, or more one hour and a half, we, if we consider the fixed effect specification, which is the preferred one. In terms of hour worked, um, of women's hour worked, uh, there is no significant effect instead in terms of employment among uh, women. When we consider the effect on housework and childcare, we see that uh, the, there, is, uh, there is an increase in terms of housework, but it's not significant. While uh, women, after the reform, are more likely to be mainly responsible for children. Uh, one may, worry, or may be worried that housework time is, pre is less precisely estimated, in, um, is prone to measurement error, is more difficult to recall uh, housework time, but if we look at the probability of performing Housework chores, uh, which is not this one. Uh, which is not here. Uh, also, in that case, uh, we do not have uh, any effect uh, on the pro uh, of the reform. Uh, moreover, uh, we can look at the heterogeneous effect and see if they are also informative. So, first of all, the reduction in terms of hours worked. Uh, both on average, but also when we include overtime, is of about four hours per week, and is significant only among high educated women. Uh, while among low educated women, the reduction is uh, not significant. Uh, moreover, among high educated women, there is also an effect at the extensive margin, so there is a reduction of 7 12%, also in terms of employment. Uh, once again, there is no effect uh, on housework, not only, but on top of that, uh, if we consider the specification with fixed effect, uh, the effect, the, the result is even negative. So we are really, there is really no increase at all in terms of housework time. Uh, and uh, also for the probability of being mainly responsible uh, for children, it is significant only among high educated women. So I have uh, estimated the effects for uh, men, uh, but we should, uh, we should consider that, first of all, uh, they have an incentive to increase the labor supply according to the theoretical prediction by Chiappori, but they also have an incentive to reduce their labor supply because they know that uh, any addition, every additional income that they earn will be split uh, with a wife. So they have uh, an incentive not to increase the, the labor supply. And in addition, we know that uh, men tend to have a smaller elasticity of labor supply compared to women. Indeed, there is basically no effect uh, on, the, on labor supply and on housework time. To be sure that uh, uh, I'm not estimating uh, a change in preferences, I have, I have considered different group of, uh, groups of placebo. So first of all, I consider cohabiting women, which are the most similar group to married women. Uh, but uh, they are not very, uh, it's not a very large group. So you also consider never married women and as a third group, non-married women, which include never married, separated, divorced, and widow. And in all cases, I do not find any effect among, uh, of, the, of the reform among these groups of women. And uh, finally, in terms of dynamic effects, uh, I do not see 
any effect before 2000, so we can really exclude all anticipation uh, any anticipation effect. Uh, while there is an effect on work uh, until 2003, and when we consider only high educated women until 2005, while the effect on childcare is uh, large and significant only until 2001. And this is more, um, is more strange because there is no reason in principle for women to stop being mainly responsible for children. Uh, my explanation of this, uh, of this effect uh, is that uh, given that I'm considering couples already married before the reform to exclude composition effects, uh, um, also they are less likely to have young children as the time passes by. So probably the uh, women are less likely to be mainly responsible for children once they are getting older. And there, are, there is an additional important assumption when we consider difference in difference is that uh, there should be no other legal changes at the same time. Uh, in reality, there were some changes at the same time in, uh, in the UK. The first two should not affect my results because they were uh, enforced in the entire UK, so also in Scotland, which is my control group. Um, there are a couple of... Um, of other reforms, in particular the free formal personal care, in, the introduction of free formal personal care in Scotland, which is more worrisome. Indeed, in this case, um, there was the introduction of, of, fermo, of uh, personal care for old people. So women taking care of this, of their, uh, let's say, of the mother, now have, have more time to work. So maybe the effect that I'm estimating is simply the effects uh, of an increasing uh, labor supply in Scotland and not the opposite. Uh, to, to exclude this possibility, I have performed some robustness check focusing only on 1999 and 2001, and the effects are confirmed. So here are again the effects uh, only on these two years. So I will split the conclusion because I'm running out of time, but I really would like to stress uh, the, the, to discuss uh, one minute uh, the conclusion of this uh, paper. So the strongest channel seems to be the increased bargaining power of women. Indeed, the married women have no incentive or little incentive to increase uh, housework, um, household uh, investments. However, the question is how should we interpret the effects on childcare? So one possibility is that we consider childcare as pure leisure, but uh, this is difficult to buy as an explanation. On the other hand, it is possible that women are increasing marriage-specific investments, but only in more enjoyable activity. So at least childcare, even if not pure leisure, is more enjoyable than housework. And also in an activity which is more expensive when you buy from the labor market. So babysitting is more expensive than, uh, than housework and also in terms of opportunity cost. I may be more, um, it, it's maybe easier for a mother to let uh, someone, ex external one, uh, taking care of the house uh, and uh, then of the, of the child. And uh, the important thing is that there is a policy trade-off. So if we consider that uh, the community property is a way to protect the financially weaker spouse, and to recognize the role of domestic work, this is very important, but on the other hand, uh, it in, uh, induce, it creates some disincentive to work for a specific group of uh, people, so uh, married women that normally we would like to keep in the labor market. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a very interesting example of how yeah, legal changes can have some spillover effects, non-intended spillover effects on other spheres. Questions? I don't know, but I really like this, this way of presenting that we mainly try to find with economists. They, they always do these robustness checks, and that means that they are anticipating all of, of your comments and questions, and so the audience is often left with that. Okay, how, what can I say? You did it all. <laughs> No, I was just thinking about the channel. You said that the strongest channel is through the bargaining power of women. Um, given that your results are really m more significant for highly educated women and uh, both in the intensive and extensive margin, I, I don't 
know how you can rule out that this is just an income effect, a pre an expected income effect uh, that uh, is, um, and that those t group of, that group of women are on their backward bending labor supply. Uh, and whereas the low educated are on the upward bending <laughs> part of the lab their labor supply, so the effects are different. But I mean, this change just can modify the expected uh, total income of the women. So I, I just w wanted to know how you ru you distinguish between these two channels. No, um, so it can be also that uh, it's an income effect in terms of uh, of the family. What I wanted to stress uh, is that. Uh, uh, is not that women have an incentive uh, to invest more in the in the household, it seems, than uh, than outside. So in in, in this sense, uh, uh, bargaining power. So they have uh, because they do not increase housework time. So that's my. So if they want to invest more in the household, uh, they should increase also uh, housework time. While well, this is not the case. Okay. <laughs> No, I think that this is actually an argument that is against your bargaining power uh, hypothesis because in that case, uh, I, I think that the income, the just pure income effect would increase, uh, would re reduce their labor supply and decrease their leisure, which is exactly what you get, right? <laughs> I, I think a related question is, uh, you said at the very beginning that uh, work gives you disutility and leisure gives you utility, which is the basic assumption here. Uh, I, th I think you have in mind, though, a ranking of uh, leisure type. So you have, like, working outside the home is better than working outside, uh, inside the home. Yes? <laughs> it, it gives you more disutility to work doing house chores than working in your workplace. And uh, it's slightly better to attend your children than, than doing the housework, right? So this ranking, I think you should disentangle a little bit because I'm not sure that the market wage would um, compare to all of this uh, in the same way, if you see what I mean. Okay. So the marginal utility that you, you derive from doing this marginal disutility that you derive from this may not be paid with the same market wage. Yeah? yeah I should yeah I should take <laughs> that into account as well. Okay, if if there are no other questions then I'm adding one given that we have still half of a minute left. Um, I was wondering if whether you, given that you have nice longitudinal data, individual level data, and then, then I was wondering if whether you might want to consider a bit more in detail the individual level and the indi individual information that you have. And you do know people's, um, of course, work careers, uh, but you also know details on their family careers. And also, this might be problematic in terms of causal estimates, but it would still enrich the picture that we might get in, in a descriptive way um, when you might split between those who divorce at some point later on. Um, yeah, just to, to, to see a bit more, to, because they might be very different. You might grasp some idea about different strategies of investing in or disinvesting in? Yeah, it's something that they haven't done, but uh, given that they have panel data, for sure I can consider the, what they did afterwards and see their choice earlier. That's it's a good um, suggestion, thank you. Okay, thank you. So now last, but of course not least, uh, we move on to our last presentation by Annalisa Frigo. Annalisa Frigo presents a paper together with Eric Rocca, um, which is something a bit different from what we had so far, and it brings us back to the roots of gender equality. Um, both authors are currently PhD students from Leuven University in economics, and yeah, we will learn something about 
where gender equality or inequality comes from and how long-lasting these effects are. Please. Thanks a lot. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, before starting, I want to thank uh, the organizers, the three universities, uh, the scientific committee and Valeria's family, because it really means a lot for me to take part uh, uh, to this conference. And thank you also on behalf of my co-author, Eric, which, uh, who unfortunately cannot uh, attend today. So the title of our joint project is Roots of Gender Equality, the Persistent Effect of Bilinage's on Attitudes Toward Women. And as she was correctly saying, we look at the very deeply rooted um, origins of these gender equality or inequality, or more uh, generally speaking, uh, these attitudes uh, towards the division of roles. Um, so today we mentioned uh, a couple of uh, policies uh, and their impact on economic outcomes, for instance, the uh, parental leave, but we said uh, still the, the cultural uh, norm is still strong and is still biasing than the, the outcomes. So we look at the origins of these uh, culture. And in particular, we exploit a unique setting, the one of a medieval institution called the Begins. And I'll tell you why we believe that this is relevant and interesting to study this long-term effect of institutions on gender roles. So this movement, as I said, uh, is a medieval uh, phenomenon, and it consisted of uh, female-only communities uh, of women living together to conduct a semi-religious life. Why semi-religious? Um, because um, they were, of course, driven by a uh, spiritual uh, life and spending time praying and so on. But besides charitable work, they were also working for pay as nurses, teachers, uh, in the textile production and so on. Uh, this movement characterized the Spanish Low Countries, so mainly Belgium and the Netherlands, but also some neighboring regions in France and Germany, from the 13th century, the very beginning of the 13th century onwards. So many communities lasted for centuries. So um, some historians consider this movement as one of the very first feminist movements. Because as I said, they were not really nuns. They were looking like, like nuns, but they were not nuns at all. Because uh, they were not taking any permanent vows, nor of poverty, nor of chastity. Uh, so they could retain their family wealth and work for pay, as I said, so accumulating further wealth. And then at any point in time, leave the beginage. That's the name of this kind of village in medieval towns. Leave it and go back to their family, to their town, maybe in a rural area, or getting married. Uh, so they enjoyed this freedom of choice. Um, and they could do that even if they were independent of any male authority. So there was no bishop granting them the right to be there and conduct their life. Uh, so as I said, they were not officially recognized. But nonetheless, they were very much involved in the urban economies. So they displayed this unusual business acumen to such a point that they were like participating in markets. They were very entrepreneurial, like uh, as I said, producing textile or selling their crops in the local market or setting up schools and hospitals and so on. So in this project, we want to study whether, we want to empirically test whether they left any uh, imprint and any legacy that can be observed even in a contemporary era in terms of gender norms. So whether they were able to shape culture in a way that persisted for so many centuries, even lo long after they disappeared. Because as I said, most of them were shut down in the 16th century, 17th century, and so on. OK. So just a quick preview of the results. Uh, we are able to track their legacy and to show that it indeed has a positive impact in some modern uh, economic outcome, outcomes, and in particular, the wage gap in the agricultural sector between men and women, and 
the same holds true for uh, literacy rates. Uh, as it's usually done in these long-term growth uh, projects, we have to control for many confounding factors and also deal with the potential endogeneity of their appearances in given municipalities. Uh, so, there are plenty of publications on uh, gender norms and how some historical events and some institutions are able to uh, influence a lot these gender norms and for a long period of time. Uh, here I mentioned just a few recent contributions, uh, but I truly recommend the last one by Giuliano, a very recent one, which is a review of, of the, the previous literature. Uh, then there is another strand of literature um, tackling the economic impact of religious orders specifically. So the first one is for Jesuits mission in Latin America, the second one for the Cistercian monks in England, and the third one, uh, the Bethren of the Common Life is a small sect in the Netherlands. But in these three papers, there is no gender gradient. So uh, these um, religious orders uh, fostered economic growth in those specific areas where they worked. Um, but again, we don't see uh, a gender component. While in this case, this is a female-only movement and therefore we can uh, use it as an experiment. Lastly, uh, let me mention the historical key references that we used. Uh, the book by Simon provided us the um, information, the historical records on beginning, begins presence, uh, so where they settled and the foundation's date, while uh, the papers by De Moor and Van Zandem are really interesting in terms of how uh, progressed were the um, women in the North Sea region already in, in the Middle Age. Okay, our methodology exploits the cross-section variation in beginnage location and duration to identify this effect on gender-related outcomes. For the moment, we focus on one country only, which is modern-day Belgium, and we use census data. So here, as I said, we want to see how far these uh, influence is stretching and so at, we would like to have at the same time the earliest possible data but at the same time the latest possible data. Let me tell you why. Um, so earliest possible data because as you know um, as we, we said today uh, welfare policies play a role in, in economic outcomes, outcomes so we would like to um, look at outcomes before let's say the 20th century and, um, and at the same time, as I said, we want to look at the latest possible data because we want to see how far uh, we can go in measuring this impact. So these data were correct, um, collected in the middle of the 19th century uh, at household level, and later on the information was aggregated at municipal level and digitized by the University of Ghent. We are exploiting the population census of 1846 and the agricultural census of 1866. In the middle, there was an industrial census, but we cannot use it because already in the 19th century, people were commuting a lot, and therefore we cannot relate the um, respondent to the town where he was born. And as we know, this uh, culture is strictly related to the place where you grew up. Our outcome variables of interest using census data are, as I said, the wage gap in the agricultural sector and the, um, literacy, the gap in the literacy rates for male and female. So this is Belgium. Um, the orange dots are the towns that have ever witnessed the beginnage uh, ever in time. Uh, here you see 70 dots, but to be honest, there are 111 beginages ever recorded in Belgium, but some of them were like plus two, more than one in, in a single town, so you observe 70 dots. And then the blue shades depict the uh, literacy equality index uh, performance. Uh, we couldn't like use the, the level of detail that we have in the census. We have more than 2,500 municipalities, uh, because, I mean, graphically was not feasible, uh, but we are going to exploit this variation in uh, outcomes. 
Okay, so here you see our uh, OLS regression, baseline regression. On the left hand side, uh, as I said, we have two outcomes of interest. They, in our way, in our theory, are proxies for female agency. And um, to show that our results are not really sensitive to uh, the choice of the specification for the literacy indicator, we have three different specifications. Uh, then our main right hand side variable of interest is, as I said, beginner's presence at municipal level. We have three different indicators, and of course we use them one at a time. Uh, a dummy variable, uh, whether a city ever had at any point in time a beginner. Then exposure time, it's kind of a continuous variable, so the number of years in which the begins lived in that municipality. And then a five level indicator that combines both the presence and duration of municipalities and also how many beginners were there in, in that town. Okay, so here are just some descriptives. Uh, the first set of variables, as I said, our, are our uh, explanatory variables of interest. Then we have uh, many demographics variable, demographic variable, and many, many uh, other variables to control for uh, geographical characteristics, as well as many other um, factors that might influence culture and human capital in the region. For instance, uh, the distance to the closest university, uh, the presence of other religious orders, so other monasteries, either female or male. Okay, so here we observe the very first um, correlations, and we see that the presence of begins is positively related with the ratio of female to male wages in agriculture. Uh, okay, here, uh, as I said, we introduce um, different variables to account for the potential wage dispersion in agriculture. And in particular, I mentioned uh, the potential caloric yield. So it's basically the soil characteristic, whether it was more or less productive. And also the distance to the rivers. Then we also introduce other um, indicators to account for uh, the, let's say, other sector, the industrial sector, how competitive was the industrial sector, so the steam engines, for instance. And to account for uh, unobserved uh, characteristics at the lo local level, we have a fixed effect at the arrondissement level. Okay, uh, a similar pattern emerges also for female literacy. Here we observe that, um, differently from the previous table, the result holds for the three different indicators of begins presence, so the continuous, the discrete, and the categorical one. And interestingly enough, we observe that while um, female monasteries have a positive and statistically significant coefficient, the other monasteries do not play any role. Okay, um, then to show that this correlation are uh, robust, we perform other uh, checks, focusing on subsamples and also including additional covariates. So we focus on a buffer of municipalities around the one with the beginners uh, to compare towns with a similar culture or to control for spillovers. Then we drop um, the big towns to show that the results are not driven by some more uh, economically advanced towns. Uh, we drop those towns which had a um, beginner open still in the 19th century. And then we also run some placebo tests and still our results remain. We perform a propensity score matching. I spare you the tables because it's almost 5 p.m. and I guess that <laughs> nobody really care. Uh, and then we also introduce other uh, covariates. Uh, in particular, uh, I just stressed the first one, so the production capacity for different crops. And this is uh, really depending on climate and geographic characteristics in Belgium. And this is a way to account for uh, possible comparative advantages of women in given crops. So they might have been more productive in some crops and therefore having, um, being more remunerated in the agricultural sector. Okay, uh, so 
we address one last concern, the one, the main one of endogeneity. So you might say that Begins decided to settle there because those towns were already more favorable to women. So in this respect, uh, if this was the case, Beguinage, Beguinages were not really uh, causing uh, this female equality, but rather simply uh, continuing this tradition. So to control for this selection of towns, we use uh, the political change in the administration of uh, these municipalities. And in particular, we implement an instrumental variable approach and our instrument is a binary variable indicating whether a town obtained the so-called municipal charter before the 13th century, so before the advent of the Beguinage. So why a municipal charter? What is it? So municipal charters were a set of privileges that were granted by the local sovereign, so a lord, for instance, granting uh, the citizens uh, some rights to administrate the city in a more decentralized way, allowing the establishment of a local market, guilds, or um, for instance, a municipal judicial system. So we believe that these municipal charters, despite being very different from town to town, were in a way signaling a more um, attractive town for begins to settle in because it was easier for them to find some real estate very easily or um, also to participate as i said in the urban market and in the economy so it was really more a, um, a signal of a vibrant city okay um, I have to mention that uh, we believe that this instrument, um, the validity of the exclusion restriction for this instrument is quite solid, as historical evidence suggests that there was no other uh, gender equal institution that was introduced thanks to uh, municipal charters. Um, moreover, one could say that uh, given that this municipal charter towns were more vibrant, they were more open to trade, so attracting uh, uh, more trade and exchanges. Uh, and usually uh, what economic historians do is control for the growth rate of the population. We do that and we see no difference uh, between towns with and without a municipality. Then we might also say that um, being more productive and more economically advanced might be an incentive to uh, be more educated, so invest in human capital. Yes, this is true, but not really the case for women. That, I mean, the returns of educating the, the son rather than the daughter were surely higher, and therefore this would play against our result. Lastly, we are not looking at whether the population was literate, more or less literate. We are looking at the gender gap. So we really care about the, the gender difference. Okay. Um, I can skip the slide. Okay. Uh, here we observe that the results are consistent with the OLS uh, results. Uh, the coefficient is still significant and higher in magnitude. So we get rid of some bias. And, um, okay a little econometric detour. Here, just the first column is significant as the second one is the traditional uh, two-stage least square, while the first one uh, has a special first stage in which we cannot basically regress the past on the future. So we have to remove all the variables in the 19th century and keep all, all, only the one in the 13th century. Okay. Uh, stronger results even for the female literacy indicator. Uh, also in this case, the F statistics is well above 10, so uh, the instrument is not weak. And that's pretty much it, let me conclude. Uh, so with this study, uh, we looked, as I said, at the long last uh, endurance of this uh, movement and whether it was able to shape uh, culture in a long-lasting way. We found that indeed it played a positive role in improving, improving the outcomes for women both 
in terms of wages in the agricultural sector and literacy. Moreover, thanks to the instrumental variable approach, uh, we can claim some causality in this relationship. Uh, I rushed a bit, but if I have one minute, I, I would add a bit on the <laughs> mechanisms. So why this happened? Why do we believe that this could spread and endure? Uh, so there are two main stories that we have in mind. The first one is uh, role modeling. So it's very hard to show with data, but the idea is that um, these women were like a living proof that the woman can uh, self-support, basically. Uh, they were independent, they were not subject to uh, their father, their husband, or their bishop, uh, and they could work and postpone marriages. So study a bit and then work and then get married. Uh, the second, uh, and this is, um, let's say, our least preferred expla uh, explanation, because in a way it's, it's not really like nuns, but could be similar to nuns, while we find no effect of monasteries alone. So the traditional religious orders were not like this. The second explanation is increased, um, is increased opportunity. So in this case, women really had a third viable choice on top of getting married and joining a um, nunnery for a, for a lifetime. So this viable alternative was uh, promoting their bargaining power in the couple and therefore um, also fostering their status in the society. Uh, okay, I think that that's it if you have any questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate very much that we can conclude this, this afternoon with a very structural and institutional approach to explain persistent gender, gender inequalities. Do you have questions? Just a clarification. I didn't get very well how is your dependent variable, the wage gap in the agricultural sector measured? Yeah. Because I think that some of the interpretation uh, okay. depends quite sure. clearly about, yeah, you know, on true. this. Okay, so... Um, the indicator is constructed as a simple ratio, wage of women, wage of men, because at the municipal level, yes, we have the information of, on, of the average at municipal level for men and women separately. So, of course, it relies on the assumption that they were performing the same task. So discrimination, of course, comes up when the same task is remunerated differently. Um, and that's why we controlled for many, many uh, geographic characteristics uh, to, to see whether they were performing the same task. If they were performing the same task in that municipality, but in another municipality, it's a different task because it's a different crop or different production, still our results would be uh, okay because it's within the village, the discrimination. I don't know whether I reply to... Yes, no, my concern was uh, on, parti on women uh, participating to the agricultural we labor market. <laughs> no, we don't have information. Because I think that where the, these women, where the participation of women in the labor market was much higher. Yeah, the only control that we have for these uh, labor market dynamics is migration rates. So we know whether these towns were attracting uh, women or men from other towns because of a particularly favorable labor market, and it's not the case. But unfortunately, we don't have information on uh, such. Um, I, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, you explained at the end the motivation or the how the mechanism works, but I think what you have to explain is how this mechanism had this long-lasting effect. Because uh, take the role model explanation, which you correctly say is the least um, appealing. Now, I would expect that the role model goes on if you have girls and you teach to these girls how to, you know, to... to, to. So, so it seems to me that uh, this is not the case if many of these women were not married or didn't have children. Um, so I think there is a third one, and I don't know how much you can explore that, is the 
teaching role that they had. So that, that could be, and that's very important, as you know, in the book by Maristella Botticini, the, the chosen few, uh, who explains, which explains the uh, role of education for, uh, well, you know the book, for, for um, Jew, the Jewish uh, tradition and how important this was. So that, that I think is more of a long lasting uh, effect that you could, uh, you could exploit. The second question, I don't know if you, if you know this, but I was quite surprised that you said that um, they could pass on their wealth, they can inherit their, their wealth, now, as far as I know, the uh, women were not entitled to any contract whatsoever to sign any contract in Europe. In, in Italy, for example, I was shocked, I learned it only recently, that it's only 1919 that women became entitled to signing a contract um, apart from the marriage contract. So, um, how, how does it square with your, your argument here? Uh, so first, let me go back to the, your education explanation. I totally agree. So they were setting up schools. They were teaching like hundreds of pupils per town. Uh, so indeed, they were really giving human capital and education to both men and uh, boys and girls. Uh, however, I mean, okay, there were like towns with thousands of begins and thousands of students, but there were, there were also towns with like 20 begins, still we believe that their example in a way shaped also uh, the culture of those observing in a way, simply the fact that they existed. Uh, your second comment, um, sorry, I'm a bit <laughs> lost. Um, that they could inherit. Ah, sure, sure. Uh, so I read uh, that the, the situation was totally different in the North Sea region, so on, on the coast really, uh, the Netherlands and Belgium, because uh, there, um, both when they were not married and when they were married, women were taking part to the business of their husband or their father, because uh, they were abroad traveling in the sea for months, so they were in charge of keeping, I don't know, uh, accountability and so on. Um, so in this respect, th that region is an exception, and yeah, and it's really thoroughly explained in the paper by Van Sandem and de Moor how how really culture diverged uh, very quickly, uh, very soon. Sorry, um, between the southern uh, Europe and northern Europe. I'm not so sure whether this is cultural differences, actually. I mean, but okay. Also, purely economic incentives, you mean, yeah. I mean, and, and very nice example in, in the area of where you're placing yourself with that paper is the work by Becker and Versman on uh, the alternative explanation of um, Protestantism. Protestantism and they, they explain yeah, the, the, the economic growth simply by literacy rates. I mean... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but uh, I mean, anyway, in that region, the, um, the set of rights that they enjoyed is key. So these institutions were providing economic incentives that then led to growth. Uh, but the simple fact, for instance, of being entitled to the Mm, inheritance before or after being married. So this is a clear incentive for getting married right away or not, or also whether they were moving elsewhere when married or living with their family of origin. I mean, plenty of uh, tiny traditions that still uh, have a very strong impact in the labor market. Okay, but the take home message is that we can change things and we maybe don't need to wait for cultural change, which is chronically very, very slow to happen, but we can intervene in other th ways. And of course, welfare state and all these sorts of policies are fundamental, as we learned in several parts of it. I can just say thank you to all our presenters, to our young contributors, promising. I'm, I'm simply curious to, to see you some years from now and I'm pretty convinced you will have a brilliant career. 
there is some path dependency there as well, I think. <laughs> and of course, also to our yeah, more senior contributors, Linda Laura Sabadini and Maria Letizia Tanturi. Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience. Thank you, thank you for having resisted until the end of it. And yeah, maybe see you next year. <laughs>